Hi, everyone. Everybody still awake after lunch? So far, yes. Ah, I see this movement already. OK. We'll, I'll try to keep you entertained. Let's see. Um, so oftentimes, you start developing your applications. And well, this is Java, and we use Gradle. And it's development, and everything is fine. And then you put it on a test server, and you have one instance. And maybe you do cat to see your logs. And then you might get a bit more advanced to see what is going on in your logs, and you start using tail f just to see what is going on. And then you're maybe even more advanced, and you use uh, less plus capital F. Anybody knows what is the advantage of this over tail f? So the nice thing about less plus capital F is you can still follow the file, so it's like tail f. But you can just break out of that with Control c and just go up and down or search like in Vim with slash whatever you want to search for. And then you can keep following the file again. So you basically, with tail f, you always have to break out of tail f if you want to go back in the history and see something or search something. And here you can just do that while staying in less. And this is fine for a while. Um, and oftentimes you're saying, well, this is fine. And our logs are OK. And we still manage our logs. And then you say, like, OK, now let's put this into production. And once you start putting this into production, stuff is not so fine anymore, maybe. So what you will get next is maybe you have three instances of the, the application running. And then you have three windows you need to keep track of in parallel. And then you scale it up, and then it's even more windows. And then you don't even know where are you logged in anymore, and where are the logs. And you're basically finding little pieces of traces here and there, but you don't really see the big picture anymore. And you connect to so many instances that this is no longer fine anymore. And yes, you figure out this is a problem. And basically, we want to avoid the bottom half, where everything is on fire and everything is terrible. So that's the general idea. We want to keep the logs more or less manageable, and that's where we want to go. Um, also, if you have very large log files, at some point, um, finding the right thing in a log file is getting very complicated. And you don't want to be that little submarine uh, trying to find something on the big Titanic. And uh, that's what you might get out of that huge uh, log file. So we want to keep stuff a bit more manageable and make production easier. That's the general idea. So we want to log all the things. That's the general idea. Um, why do I talk about that? Well, I work for Elastic, the company behind Elasticsearch, Logsesh, Kibana, Beats. My official title is Developer Advocate, which mostly means going around and trying to tell what we have to offer or like things to avoid, to avoid the problems and not come to me afterwards to complain. So let's hope we can work that out together. Um, who's already using the Elk stack or who knows the Elk stack? Um, so Elasticsearch to store your data, Logstash to get it, parse it, ingest it, enrich it, and then Kibana to visualize it. I assume everybody knows when I say parse or ingest, that's kind of clear. Like you run, for example, a regular expression to parse the log level or the timestamp. What do I mean when I say uh, enrich? What is enrichment for logs or for any kind of data? Yeah, so generally, the idea is the enrichment is always we add some metadata on top of the existing data that we have. If we have an IP address, you might want to have the location of that IP address. So we do a GeoIP lookup, and then we could say, oh, this is a request coming from Barcelona in Spain. And we could draw it out on a map. Or for example, if you run on Docker or Kubernetes, you might want to have this enrichment of metadata, where you want to say, like, give me the logs for one specific namespace or pod, for example. And you would enrich that and add that additional information to the logs to make that search and kind of like the context clearer. That is enrichment and what we do. And this is very widely used. So if you use any of those, there is some sort of our stack doing the logging in the background and many, many others. Um, but at some point, we figured out Logstash is nice, but it's maybe a bit too heavy. Because, well, it started off as Ruby and is now JRuby, so you always need the JVM. And then we added Beats. Beats are lightweight agents or forwarders. They're written in Go, so you have native binaries. And then you can just ship data off. I always say it's like tail F, but over the network and on steroids. And the main problem is, is there a B in Elk? No. And we tried to fix that. We came up with this the elk, bee, or belk. And could also look like this. So you can see it's a bee, it's an elk. It's kind of the combination of both. Um, we even print them on shirts sometimes. Um, this is, bless you, this is a very nice marketing idea. But is this very scalable? What happens if we add another product to that? 
well, we need to redo the entire branding again. So it's not very scalable. And for us, we, we like scalability. And this is not the scalable approach we want to have. So we kind of took the easier route now. We just call it the elastic stack, because A, that's very elastic, and B, whatever we put into that, it will have the same name. We might have to redo those colored squares and add some different color and some different square. But otherwise, it's the same idea. It's just a more scalable naming approach. So while we did have elk for a long time, and we understand when you say elk, we now try to call it elastic stack, because, well, more scalability even for naming conventions. Um, anyway, what you get is you normally have the beats, which are like the forwarders or ingesters, or they just forward the data. And they can either forward that to Logstash, which could do the parsing and enrichment, or we could forward it to Elasticsearch directly, store the data there, and then visualize it in Kibana. And this is pretty much what we want to do. So while I use my hands-on examples with our stack, the rules what I show you in general will be applicable to pretty any logging system you have out there. So even if you have any other centralized logging system, it will be pretty much applicable in terms of what you can do and how you might approach stuff. So that's where we want to go. And well, we are only going to use a Hello World application today. Um, it is highly monitored or logged, though. So we will dive into that part. Um, I will use Java because, well, it's a boring language. Um, but that's not the point today. Um, so I will use some technologies there, but it doesn't matter so much. You can use pretty much any other technology. Um, you shouldn't bash the PHP community, but even in PHP, you have a logger, proper log appender nowadays. So even there, you don't have any excuses not to do proper logging anymore. So what we do here applies to any language and any system that we have. Um, so before we start, two things we don't want to do. First off, we don't use println for our logs, right? We all agree, because we want to have log levels and a bit for finer control over that. So we don't do that. And the second thing we don't want to have is coupling. So we don't want, when we change something in our centralized logging system, we don't want to apply any changes in our application. Or when we change something in our application, ideally, we don't have to change it in the centralized logging application, because we don't want to have this tight coupling. And this is a bit of a trade-off, and we'll see various approaches with where this works to a different degree. And now, since we start jumping into that one here, um, it's probably time to start my demo. And let me make that a bit larger so you can see something. Um, so this is just using Docker Compose. This will spin up the entire stack and one Java application that we are monitoring. And we'll monitor this in various approaches. So I will go through five different patterns, and we will look at those five different patterns. So this will start in the background, and this will take like a couple of minutes to start up. And in the meantime, I will just keep jumping into the right first pattern. So the first pattern I want to talk about is parsing. This is like the good old approach. You have a classic log file, you write it out, and you extract meaning from that log file. So what we have here, or what we are running is, we have our Java application in a container, but we have like the classic approach. So we, we write a log file, like the good old log file everybody knows. We write that out. We have FileBeat as a sidecar to collect that and forward that information to Logstash. Logstash will parse it, and then we store it in Elasticsearch, and we can visualize it in Kibana. And hopefully, everything in the demo works, because it's just starting up in the background. But you will see that in a moment, hopefully. So the first thing is, how do you get the log file to the sidecar, the file bit? How do we do that? So what I'm doing here is I have my Java application. So that is the one on top, the Java application. And that writes out to its logs to a bind-mounted directory, the logs docker that I put on the host. And then I mount that logs host into mount logs in the file bit sidecar. So basically, you mount it out of the Java application in the container, mount it to the host. And from the host, you mount it to the sidecar. So it's like this double mount. This is what we're doing here. Um, it's a bit manual. And there is obviously very tight coupling, because I need to configure that for all the Java applications I have running on my server. But this works, and it's just like the good old approach um, that we do. And then in the file bit to capture that log file, uh, we'll stick to mount logs. And what we'll do is we just have to tell the file bit that, well, in mount logs, anything adding, ending in .log is a log file. So basically, take that, forward it, and then you're done for the collection here. And then we'll throw that over to Logstash to do the parsing. 
Um, we can also add some ho uh, metadata. For example, we could add here some metadata about the host, so we would know which operating system this is running on. And this is just being done by the file bead because it, well, it just queries the operating system and stores that information. Um, so let's see what we have here. Let's look at our um, application before we dive into that one. So um, we have our very simple Java application. Um, it is a loop going from 1 to 20. Um, and we have this weird pattern. If something can be divided by 15, we will throw a runtime exception by 5 a warrant, by three an info, and otherwise a debug message, and we have a trace message for everything here. First off, what pattern do we have here? Anybody has been doing job interviews recently? The infamous FIS bus, where you can divide something by 15, then you would say FIS, and then by five, it, you would say bus. Um, I'm just throwing different log levels, because it doesn't matter. We just get some logs out of that. The more interesting question now is we have a loop going from 1 to 20. How many log events will you get in total? Yes, now it is the time to wake up. <laughs> how, how many events will we get? Who is for 20? Who is for 40? Who is for more? Who has no idea? <laughs> OK. Um, so ideally, it should be 40 here, um, because we have a loop, so this will run 20 times, and then we have 20 trace statements, and then we have one of each for each one. So we will get exactly one runtime exception, and we will get a couple of warrants, infos, and debugs. So w those are the ones we get. Um, did anybody wonder what is this? Any guesses what that might be? It's an emoji. You will see which emoji afterwards. Um, because emojis are important, and you might want to have emojis all over your logs, so we do support that by now. Um, so we are kind of emoji approved. Um, that should not be an issue. So um, let me add, or let me open another browser window. So um, let me head over. If everything in my demo worked, we should have um, Kibana running now. Um, by the way, what did I even do? So this is very simple. I use Docker Compose. We have one Elasticsearch instance. We have one Logsash instance. We have one Kibana instance. These are just pretty much the default settings. Um, we do have a Logsash configuration that's maybe more interesting. We'll get into that later on. Um, and we then have various file beads to collect the logs that we have on our instance. And we'll just collect them. And you can see here, for example, I'm doing the magic where I'm putting that bind-mounted folder into the file bead for Logstash container to be able to read that. And then I have some configurations around that as well, but that's not that relevant. Um, and while I have been talking, hopefully, the stack has come up here in the background. Let me make that slightly larger. I hope that's readable for everybody. The first thing I want to do is I have different index patterns, and we should see um, these are the number of events that we have collected. And these are also the five patterns, or the, the patterns that we will look into. So we were in parse, and you see we have 42 documents. How many documents did we assume we should have? 40. I mean, 42 is generally always the right answer, um, but not in this specific example. Um, something went wrong. Um, can anybody already guess what might have gone wrong? No, not the emoji. The emoji is. The emoji is all correct. Um, so what we have here now, we don't want Docker, we want the parse example. So the first thing when you collect log lines is you can see here, this is when I, when I started my demo and I have my 42 log events. And 42 is not the right number. And you could open that one up and you see all the information that is in here. Um, for example, let's say I want to just see the log message and I can open that one or toggle that column if I do that, then I will just see the timestamp and the log level. And you can also see that something is sticking out here, right? That this one here doesn't have a log level. Um, and I, if I open that one up, um, what do we have here in a message? That's part of the stack trace. Because we had a runtime exception, and that stack trace generated two lines in the stack trace. And those are the additional two lines. Is one line of a stack trace very helpful on its own? Not really, because the stack trace is only meaningful if it's kind of like in the right context. And that's one of the first problems you might run into, that if you break stuff up by line, 
it will not be very helpful to actually um, make that work. But we can fix that. Um, so do you assume it's easier to put something together after we've broken it up or not break it up in the first place? What would be easier? Yeah, then not breaking up is much easier. It's pretty much like if you have meat and you put it through a grinder and then you have the hashed meat, putting that back into the original meat will be very hard. And that's pretty much what you would get with the stack traces. Um, but what we want to have is we have the file bit log stash configuration here. And let me uncomment that one here. So you can define a multi-line pattern. Because when you run your Java application, which, by the way, I have not run yet, so let me quickly run my Java application. Um, so when you run that, you will see that every line starts with a square bracket, because that is the logging pattern that I have defined. And you can see here, this is what a one line looks like. And here you can see this was the stack trace. And you can see here we have our emo emoji. So that was the emoji that we had in there. And we will be able to find that in the logs. It will be properly displayed and everything as well. Um, but you can see, for example, every line starts with a square bracket. If it doesn't, then it's a continuation from the previous line because if it, it's a stack trace. And then, basically, we define this rule and say, like, it needs to start with a square bracket. Um, otherwise, it's a continuation of a previous line. And there would be multiple ways you could put that. that you could say, like, a line that starts with a square bracket, is, that is a new event, or a line that doesn't start with a square bracket, that is a new event. So you could combine those settings in multiple ways. Um, we have that in our documentation completely. Um, so if you have negate and the match and you could combine them, these are all the possible patterns you could put together to match stuff together or not. It's part of our documentation. Um, we won't have time to go into the details here, but this is just to find the right way to not break up a stack trace into its independent pieces. That's the general idea. Um, you can also test this multi-line pattern. We have it in our documentation. Here, for example, you could see here we have the pattern that we are testing for. And then you can add some log lines here. And in the output at the bottom, it would tell you true, false, if this will be a new line or not. And that way, you could test if your multi-line patterns are correct. So this is an important thing. Don't break up your stack traces, because you will basically destroy them. And they will not be usable anymore. So don't do that. Um, the next thing is to actually parse that and get the information out, because here we have the log line, and we have a log level, and the class where this is coming from, and the method. In our Kibana, you can see we have, um, we have that nicely parsed out. So you can, well, you cannot see the log level on this one because this is broken up. But on this one here, here, emoji, by the way, um, here you can see we have the error and the log method. Those are all nicely parsed out. How do you get that from a log line? How do you get back to the individual pieces? Well, we write a regular expression to get the information out of that. Who likes writing a regular expression? That's the Stockholm Syndrome, right? where you got so used to just doing something because, well, it's, it's the old way to do it. Um, yes, you can do that. Um, and you can define the right grog pattern. Um, we also have, like, we have the so-called grog debugger in Kibana to make that a bit easier. So just to give you an idea, here under that wrench icon, we have the grog debugger. You can add some sample data here, and then you can start writing the regular expression in there. And sometimes people are confused, like, what is even grok and how does it work? So what um, grok looks like is we have, it's like a named regular expression. And no, I didn't want to open it three times. One time is fine, I think. Um, so for example, here, these are basically names for regular expressions. And then you can just put them together. So you don't always need to write the regular expression itself. But you can rely on these pays, uh, like free configured parts. And for example, the one we will need for our timestamp, this one, I just happen to know that this one is the correct one. So what we can do is we can uh, take that part, and then I need one line here. So let's say we take this line here. We can throw it into the grog debugger. So here is our example. And then we can say, we start writing a regular expression. How do I start? How do I start parsing that line? Where are, the, where are the people that like reg writing regular expressions? So, well, the line has to start somewhere, so we have this little roof icon. Um, then we need to escape the square bracket, and then we can actually say, like, oh, now we have the timestamp. 
And that is exactly the pattern that I have here, timestamp ISO uh, 80, 8601. Um, you can then say, like, I want to apply this grok pattern here. So that's a uh, percentage sign, and then you have a curly brace. You say, oops, that's not the one I wanted. Um, this is the field I wanted. And I want to put this into a field, and I call the field, uh, let's say, log.level. And I close it. And then when you simulate this, you can see log.level. This is what I have extracted here. And then you could say, OK, next up, we need to close that square bracket. And then we have a space. Um, so this is, by the way, another nice trick. This will eat any space. It could be a tab or multiple spaces. This will eat any white space you have. Um, it will just eat it. And since I don't give it a name, it will just disappear. And then we have the log level. Um, or sorry, this should actually be timestamped. This doesn't make much sense. Uh, but next up, we have, and I think we could just use, uh, it's just a word. So it's just ASCII characters. And this one I want to put into log.level. And if I have done that correctly, you can see you parse that out. Those liking writing regular expressions, um, you will have a great day today when you write that for the entire thing. But maybe not everybody likes that. Um, we have added something to make it a bit easier. It's called machine learning. It's we could argue if that is proper machine learning or not. But it can basically, you can upload some data. Um, let me just head over to the right file. So we need documents. We're in GitHub. We have Java logging. Uh, we have logs. I upload a log file. You can upload a log file. It will be analyzed automatically. And it will say, like, hey, I know what is in here. I have found 41 events. And it generates a grok pattern for you. This is not perfect, but this is a starting point. So you can just use that to get started on writing better regular expressions. And it will also show you at the bottom, like, hey, this is what I found. Like, 51% of, of your events are traces, and then you have the other log levels. And you can see these are the messages and the timestamps. This is what I have extracted here. So this is a good starting point to get started if you have lots of different files you need to parse. Um, and you can then add that to log slash, and it will do the right parsing for you. Um, so that was the grog debugger. Um, so this at the bottom, this is the right regular expression or grog pattern to actually parse that log line, if you want to write that. Um, and you can then use that visualizer to make it easier. So the nice thing about this approach overall is you don't have to change your application, because you just work with your regular log files. Um, but you need to write regular expressions, you need to not break up multi-lines. And if you have any format changes in your log pattern from your Java application, you need to have that in your grok pattern as well. So you have a bit of coupling between them. So this is, not, this is an OK approach, but this is not the perfect approach. What else could you do instead? Jason. Yes, Jason. Jason is step three. Um, we have something in between. Um, so the first thing you could do is you could just say, like, I have a log appender that can send it directly to my application. Um, so basically what we have, we have a special log appender. So I'm using logback, and there is a log appender that can talk to log, uh, log stash directly. Since your application already knows what is what, you don't have to write it out to a file and parse it back. You can just send it in the right format right away. And then you're done. What is the main downside of this approach? Let's have a look. Um, we're heading back to this one here. Uh, we don't want to do that now. Um, let's head over to what we have in the indices. So we looked at the parse index that had 42 events. Um, and now we have the send index. And the send index, this is the one here, it has zero events. Why? Because when my Java application was starting up, it couldn't reach logs yet, because it was still starting up. And then it just threw away the logs, so you lost your logs. So again, it's some kind of coupling. Um, whereas with the log file, we can just process the log file after the fact, so that's fine. But what, would be, what we can do is we can run the, the application again. So let's see what we have running here. I need, there is a, somewhere I have my Java application, and I need the ID, so we need this one here. And we can just say docker restart and that ID here. So we'll rerun that. Um, by the way, when we keep refreshing that, here in the parse, since I have added the multi-line statement, this should add 40 lines now and not 40. And it should add 40 to the send index. So if I reload that, you can see here now we have 82. The multi-lines are fixed. And we also have 40 events in this one for the send uh, because that one worked now. 
So if you look here to the send one, you can see we missed kind of the first event we did a couple of minutes ago, but now this one worked. You don't have any multi-line trouble. Um, you can see this is what we have extracted. We don't have like the full message with the full log line because there is no full log line. You have all the individual pieces broken up and this works. It will work with emojis and everything as well. Um, but, so this is the logback appender basically. You need to configure where is log slash running to talk to it. And then that's all that there is. The good thing is you don't have any log files so you don't need to parse them. But what happens if the network is down? Or what happens if the destination of your log appender changes? You have some more coupling between the systems. So if, for example, your, your log slash is down and your application keeps logging, once it has reached it for the first time, it will buffer up to 200 megabytes of logs, but then it will throw them away. But that is a log back, the log appender I'm using, a specific configuration. So that 200 megabyte limit is just because it's in that log appender. Um, so there is some coupling, and maybe you want to see your logs exactly when the network is down. So we might want to use a different approach. And you already mentioned JSON. So what we could do is we could log in a structured format. So we write out the logs in JSON directly. Um, so basically, you write out the JSON file, then FileBeat can take the JSON file and put it directly into Elasticsearch because Elasticsearch also stores JSON, so you don't need any parsing, you're done. We don't need log session in that example anymore. Um, and what you basically need to do is you need to say, like, hey, there's a JSON file, and this one is JSON. You basically need to say, like, hey, it's JSON, so do the right thing. Um, but otherwise, we're then done. Um, and that works as well. And that can do a couple of interesting things. So let me switch over to that one here. So that one is the structure one. And you can see here, oh, have I been talking too much already? So let's see. Let's say we go back 30 minutes. And you can see here, we had 40 events. So this worked from the beginning. Um, 40 events here, so this is working. You can just open up the event. You can see this is all good. Like, Everything is nicely parsed and structured here. Um, the one thing, if you have the stack trace, which is the error here, that has one nice attribute, that you have that stack trace here, and it should have a stack hash. This one here is basically the hash of the stack trace. And by using that hash, you could find out how many unique stack traces do I have in my application, and how often do they appear. So what should I fix first? But this is a feature of the log appender that it just hashes the stack trace. But this is a nice addition if you use this approach that you can work more with the log appender. And otherwise, you can see emojis are working everywhere, um, and we get all the details out of this. And you could, for example, say, like, OK, um, the log level, or did I just, uh, it's under my favorites here. Um, and you could see this is the breakdown of the log levels. And you could just say, like, oh, I'm only interested in the info messages. Uh, click on that one and filter down on this one, and you see here. Now we have five info messages, and you could see those five info messages. So that's working very nicely, and there is no big voodoo to it. Um, you could even say, like, I want to put that in, those into different indices. For example, I want to keep the error data longer than I want to keep the debug or info data, or warn, for example. Um, so you could extract, you could say, when the message contains warn or error, I want to put that into different indices, and they have a different lifetime, so I keep them for different times. Or you could have like a, a special, uh, I don't know, character sequence where you say, this is like a security incident. And security incidents will have a different lifetime, and you will keep them around for longer than other log events. So you could do that just in the output where we filter out where it should go and have those different life cycles, basically. Um, so the nice thing about logging to JSON is it's the right format for most structured logging systems. Maybe you have some overhead in JSON serialization, um, but otherwise it's the same. By the way, how do we treat multi-line events here like stack traces? How will they look like in our log? Any guesses? So let's have a quick look. So we have a folder, if I see my folder, called logs. And here you have a JSON file. And you can see these are all my log events, so they are nicely structured. And if you scroll to the right, you can see the long one is the stack trace here. And you can see um, in the stack trace, oh no, sorry, not this one. Wake me up at night somewhere, we should see 
where is it? In the, in the log message, you will see that you have backslash n, backslash t, for example. Um, that you have multi lines, it's just one line in JSON always. So this is, once somebody commented and said, like, this is not a proper JSON file because it has lots of JSON lines, which is true, but we can consume that correctly. Um, and it will just, every log event will be one line, and a new line will basically be backslash n, backslash t um, to, for the proper intendation. And, and uh, yeah, to do that here, this line would have a backslash n, backslash t to symbolize that character. Okay. Next up, maybe you want to throw your application into a container. And, well, that's pretty much the same. I assume everybody is using Docker here, right? Because we also mostly integrate into Docker very nicely. So, where do you put FileBit? Generally in a sidecar. So you have one FileBit instance running, and that can get the logs of everything else. Where do you put the logs of your containers if you don't want to write out the classical log file? What is the Docker way of writing logs? Yeah, system out, standard out, um, and it lands in the default JSON Docker log by default, and we can just collect that. And what we do here basically is we have the, do the standard out that we are writing that ends up in the, in the default Docker log that we write out to disk. We mount that folder into the sidecar container, and from there we just read the files, what is happening. And um, we have some samples of how to configure that. It's hidden in the Beats repository pretty deeply. In master, de sorry, in deploy Docker, there you have the patterns. Um, I'll show you the most important ones as well, but you would find them in our repositories as well, by the way. So what you do here is we say um, file beat, auto discover, and this is Docker. So this will figure out like, hey, I know how Docker works. I know where to get the data. Um, only how does the sidecar know or have access to that folder? Well, we need to mount it correctly again. So what we have in our Docker Compose file, um, if I go back to my Docker Compose file, we have the file beat for Docker Elasticsearch. What you need to do is you need to mount from the host the varlib Docker containers where all the logs are. You need to mount that in the same place into the sidecar container, and then it will automatically pick that up because it knows this is where the logs are supposed to be. Or you could install file build on the host directly, and then it would just know where the Docker logs are on your host. But sidecar is kind of nicer to put that here. Um, by the way, I'm adding some more stuff, like I'm mounting the Docker socket into that. Any guesses why I might be doing that? To get the metadata. So I will use the Docker API to get metadata about the container. Um, so we can fetch that information as well. Um, so how does that look like? Um, let's head over to Docker. And also here you can see now I have a filter applied. Let's get rid of the filter. And suddenly I have way more logs. Why do I have so many logs? Yes, these are all the containers that I have running are logging to the same place, and I'm collecting all of them. Because I haven't said, like, just collect for one specific container, but for all the containers. How do I get to my application that I care about? Sorry? Yeah, so since we have this enrichment with the labels, um, I think it's called uh, container label app. And then luckily it will suggest the labels that we have in our system. And I have called my application FizzBus because, well, that's the pattern that it's outputting. So you could just say, like, just give me everything for the FizzBus application. And then if I run that, you can see now we have um, the events. The 41 here, don't be confused. The 41, there is one event from the, it's like when the container starts up, the log appender itself is logging one event here. That's why we have 41 here. If we would go down to the very bottom, uh, you would see here um, that is basically the, this is just an info message from the log appender itself that we have collected here from system out. But otherwise, this is collecting the right information. So here we have 41 events, and here we have 40. And if you open one up, um, so you can see we have all the Docker metadata. This is what we got from the Docker socket. And we have put all of that together. That's nice. And we also have like the nice extracted information. So we know this is 
the random session and the loop that where we are in our application, we have the log level, the method, like we have all the bits and pieces. Um, so how did I get that actually? So let me look at the log appender for a moment. If I find my log appender. So the one we are using here is the console one. So you can see I'm writing to console that system out that's being collected by the log. But here again, I have one log line. And I need to parse that back. But I didn't have log session in my example. How could I have parsed that back? Any guesses? So we have another concept in, in our stack to for do the parsing. And that's inside Elasticsearch itself. It's a so-called ingest node. And it can run the same grok patterns that you have in Logstash, but you can run them in Elasticsearch itself. It doesn't have all the features of Logstash, but it has a subset, like grok is possible. And what we do here is when we set up that, um, that Elasticsearch instance, we basically add that pattern here. And you can see there comes in a message, and we parse that. And that's just the same pattern that we've seen before. Just because this is a JSON file, you need to escape the backslashes. Um, but otherwise, this is the same thing what we are doing in Logstash before. I've put into Elasticsearch itself now, because it can do everything that we need for this example, and we don't need Logstash. And this is just an API you can configure it in Elasticsearch to add those grok patterns to run them there as well. So we did the parsing from the system out. We parsed that again. Instead, we could write JSON to system out and then collect that correctly as well there. But I wanted to have that in just node concept in here as well. That's why I, I added that. Um, you can see we are getting the docker metadata through that annotation, so that talks to the socket. And we have one other thing. We have hints enabled. And hints is um, that we have, basically, we have a bit of an inversion of control on the configuration. What we do with hints is I have my Java application at the very bottom. And here in that Java application, I apply these labels. So you app fizzbuzz is what we used in the labels already. We also have an environment, which I didn't really use here. And we have our own namespace, coelastic logs. And here, you could add the multi-line pattern. So basically, what we do is we bake these labels into the container. And FileBeat automatically picks up that configuration and applies the right configuration to that container. So we don't need to say anymore for this specific container or this Docker ID, apply these rules for a multi-line statement. But we basically bake it into the image. And then the image brings the rules to FileBeat. And FileBeat can just apply the right rules. So configuration is much easier. And it's just tied to the specific container, because the container knows how it's logging and how the rules should be to actually work with that. So you don't have that much coupling or hard configuration anymore um, going on. Um, so that's the, the type hinting that we have here. This is, makes configuration much easier. And yes, this is what you get out of this. Um, sometimes you don't get the last line from the Docker log, because the Docker log doesn't always do the new line at the very end. And FileBeat always waits for a new line at the very end to collect that line, because it's not sure if it's finished otherwise. That's why you sometimes might miss the very last line. Um, yes, we've seen the hints. Um, one other thing that is important, there is a registry file which tells FileBeat how far did you get in the log. Like, what have you collected already? And you should mount that out of the container. Why? If I update my FileBeat sidecar, it would start up, and it would see the files, and it would say, like, oh, I have not seen any of those. I will start from the beginning. And it would, you would then have duplicate logs. And with that registry file, I basically put that on the host, and I store it on the host, so I always know what have I collected in the logs already. Um, we've seen the ingest pipeline, uh, how that worked. Uh, sometimes you have unknown fields, and you need to refresh the index. Um, but for time, I'll skip that in today's demo. Some applications try to be cute and have this ASCII art when they start up, like Redis. Is this very helpful for centralized logging? Not really because you're not going to find anything in there. What you can do is you can define a template. Here, Docker container image. That's the Docker metadata that we're using again. And you could define a configuration, say, if something is a Redis container, I know there will be this ASCII art, and just remove that ASCII art. And the last line, the exclude lines, this is the right regular expression to filter out the ASCII art. Um, so this is how you could get rid of that. And one other thing is, 
if the file beat is logging to system out as well, like everything else, and there is an error in there, it would log out the error to system out, and then it would try to collect that same its own error message. So the problem is, where does the logger log? Because you don't want to have a logging loop. So what you can do is you can explicitly say, file beat, if running as a sidecar in a container, should not go to system out, but rather um, go to its own file, where you can see what is wrong with it, so you avoid a logging loop. That's also an important concept there. OK, so it's hot stuff, but it's a bit more complex. And to finish off quickly, when we want to orchestrate, probably we mean Kubernetes. And where do you put FileBeat? Normally in a daemon set. So you have one instance running on every host. Um, we have the deployment scripts for those as well, so you can just look into those. But it's doing kind of the same concept as with Docker. Um, so you can run it in the daemon set, and then you can say, like, add Kubernetes metadata is where is the Kubernetes API. So you can get the metadata, and you know what is the pod name, what is the namespace, what is the host. So you can get all of that information from the logs and correlate those. Um, and then you would get something like this. So you would see the node and whatever metadata you have. Um, you can add more metadata, but that's probably going too far for today. You can do the same thing now with the Kubernetes namespace for Redis, where you remove the ASCII art. But this is just a slightly different configuration version of that. Um, you could even customize the indices. For example, you could say we have one index per namespace where we want to log. And this one here is slightly confusing because you, if you have a Kubernetes namespace, we will use the Kubernetes namespace. If there is no Kubernetes namespace, we will put it into an index called FileBeat. So the colon is not like this and this, but the first one, if it exists, or the other one. Then we have the beat version, because we always try to version it in, in case we change something in the mapping in the background. And then we have probably a date pattern where we have like a different index for every day. That might be one option. Even hotter, um, but even more complex. So only do that if you have to. Um, so to wrap up, um, if you want to get all the sample codes and you want to run it yourself, you just need to do Docker Compose up, and then everything is running, and you can see the configuration files. This is where it is. Um, if you take one picture, this is the one, because this is where you get all the code. But I'll tweet out the slides and everything afterwards as well, so you'll be able to find that. Um, everybody done taking the, the one important picture? OK. <laughs> Good. Now is the time to wake up, by the way, as well. So this, this is the one. If you missed anything, this is the one you want to remember, and then you're good. Um, so we've seen the different approaches with their pros and cons. You will need to find whatever makes sense for your application, but there are normally ways to make it work in one more or less painful way, hopefully. Um, and with that, I think we have like two minutes or so for questions until we need to hand over. Um, otherwise, if we run out of time, just come to the booth where we will hang around as well, and stickers and everything there as well. Yes. If you log to standard out, uh, then you don't want to have your uh, like Docker application to have uh, the logic to put the structure. But then in Kubernetes, you have one app, which is Java, one is Python, one is Erlang, one is something. So then it may be too late for, for putting the structure. So where you actually do the transformation from spitting out to standard out, uh, to that structured JSON? So ideally, you would log out to JSON directly and then have it structured, or maybe CSV, whatever you prefer. So ideally, you would have it even when you write to system out structured already. Otherwise, you would need either to have log stash or the interest node to do the parsing afterwards. So if you just write to system out, but you use the standard console pattern, then you will still need to do the, the, the grok pattern to actually parse anything out. So there is no way around that. If you can. Do it structured, because it will be less painful. If you have legacy applications and they cannot do that for some reason, then you will need to parse. I'm afraid there is no way around that. Unless you say, I don't care about that. I just want to collect it in a central place, and I don't want to extract the fields. And then you could just do a regular full text search on that without proper filtering. That's also an option. It's not mandatory to use Grok, actually. It's just an option you have. Um, wait, and before you ask the next question, I always try to take a picture so I can prove to my colleagues that I've been working. Because, you know, smile, everybody. Oh, wait, I think I need to divide you. OK, final question, then I'm off, because we need to hand over. Um, yes. Hi. 
Hi, you say you put the log stash and also the bits in a, in a container. Do you recommend to put the, the Elastic database on a container, on Kubernetes or...? Our answer for that is always, it depends. Um, and then we charge a lot of money. No, I'm joking. Um, uh, so normally, we don't care. This is like, if you run everything in containers and you're very comfortable with that concept, do, do that. If you're not comfortable with containers, I wouldn't start with the stateful stuff there, because it might be more complex and painful. Um, so it's something for you to figure out. Um, we, we don't really feel strongly about that. This is what makes sense for you operationally. We have official Docker containers. We have a Helm chart. We have a Docker operator now. Uh, sorry, a Kubernetes operator by now. So we do support those. But we also have an DBN and an RPM. So you can install any way that makes sense for you. We are not opinionated that it's something you will need to figure out what makes sense for your organization. Like, we don't care. Like, I think that's not our place to tell you how to run your applications. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you, Philip.